Hey kids, Smath here. Got a video for you on covalent bonding. At last we'd left our faithful hero. We had covered lattice energies and the energy of interaction between ionic particles and what makes ionic particles form a crystalline lattice. Now today's lesson <clears throat> is quite a bit different. Now we're talking about covalent bonding. So we're sharing electrons. There's no crystal lattice. There's no Coulomb's law. There's no energy of interactions going on because the energy is merely due to the sharing of these electron pairs. So before we find out what covalent or how this covalent is different, we have to find out if we have covalent. The way we find out if we have covalent is to look at the bond type. And so <clears throat> to figure out the bond type, we're gonna use an electronegativity difference scale. And the electronegativity values are not given on the board exam. They're gonna want us to predict those electronegativity values from the periodic table. Now for this class, we're gonna get comfortable with those values so that we kind of get a feel, and then we're gonna wean ourselves off of those values and get used to predicting things from the periodic. They're not gonna give you things that are counter electronegative. They're gonna give you uh, elements that follow the trend. And what this electronegativity trend is, is an attraction for an atom has for an electron. Now, the caveat to that is, when it's covalently bonded. So if I just say, hey, what's the electronegativity of a sodium atom? It, it really doesn't have an electronegativity. It doesn't have an electronegativity until we say, what's the electronegativity of sodium in sodium iodide. And, and then we can look at that and go, oh, well, sodium is going to have an electronegativity value of I don't 1.0 or something. I don't have the memorized. But it doesn't happen until we put it into a compound. Now, we did the trend last chapter when we did electrons and periodic table elements. But the general trend is low electronegativity is down in the bottom left, southwest. And high electronegativity is in the northeast. And the reason there is because of the atomic radii, that because the radii in the, in the top right hand of the table, these are very small. These are very almost full octets. They're going to have a strong attraction for an electron, whereas down in the lower left, they're already down five, six, seven energy levels. They already have lots of full octets and, and they're not gonna have much of a draw. They only have one or two electrons in their valence shell. So for the, the, the lower left, it's easier for them to get rid of an electron, lose an electron rather than gain. So that's why those values are there. But if we have those values, they range from 0.7 to 4.0. And so when we look at the, the maximum difference between those would be 3.3. That would be a 100% ionic bond, taking probably something like cesium and fluorine and putting them together. This is also going to have a very high energy of interaction, a high lattice energy as well. So that would be 100%. Now, if we take half of 3.3, we end up at 1.67. And sometimes you'll see 1.7 in a lot of books, but the board has mostly accepted that 2.0 is the value because 1.67 would be exactly 50%, 1.65. 1.67 would be 51% ionic. So at 2.0, we're well past, past sharing. We are introducing ionic bonding at that point. So anything with an electronegativity difference of 2.0, 
to 3.3. If it lands exactly on 2.0, we're going to treat that bond as an ionic bond. Well, what's a nonpolar bond? A nonpolar bond is where things are shared equally. And we're going to consider equal sharing when things are between 0 and 0.4. That's when we know we've, we've got pretty equivalent uh, electron densities and things are being shared that way. And we like that a lot. That's going to give us uh, a nice equivalent bond share. So now if we look and it says, hey, what kind of bonds do you have here? Well, in H2, I've got 2.1 and 2.1. The electronegativity difference is zero. Therefore, we have a nonpolar bond. We're going to be looking for things that are fairly close together on the periodic table, H2H2, all of our diatomics are going to be nonpolar, evenly shared, meaning the electron distribution is as equal on the right side of this molecule as it is on the left side of that molecule. That's what nonpolar means. Okay. If we compare that to hydrogen and chlorine, hydrochloric acid, now Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. Hydrogen is 2.1. We look at the difference and we say 0.9 makes this a polar bond. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we're talking about positive and negative poles and the separation. And the way that we make that positive and negative poles is through the electronegativity, the chlorine pulling that electron towards itself. And so when the chlorine pulls that electron towards itself, we can represent that with either an arrow or with dipole signs. Those are lowercase deltas. So delta positive, delta negative. The negative will always go on the element with the higher electronegativity. Also going to be the element that's further in the upper right-hand corner. So when you're looking for dipoles, Look for things that are very high in this upper right-hand corner. Positive things are going to be further on the left-hand side of things. We're not going to do much with dipoles and, and bonding here within the transition metals. That's beyond the scope of the board, and they're okay with that. So the arrow points towards the higher electronegativity. What that means, what this drawing is showing here, is that chlorine now, if I shade this in, the chlorine will have more electron density. And the hydrogen has less shading in it. So it has less electron density, meaning it's highly unlikely that those electrons are going to be found towards the hydrogen. Those electrons are going to be found more towards the chlorine. So the arrow is always going to show us the direction of the electron density. And we know that because it's pointing towards the higher electronegative substance. Now keep in mind, that's our only tricky side. If it's ionic, we're done. We're doing lattice energy. We're going to use brackets, positive and negative. No worries. If it's nonpolar, well, then there is no dipole. There's no arrow to show electron density. The electron density is equally shared. It only happens in the middle where things become polar, where there's a draw of electrons due to a difference in electronegativity values. And so what this is part of is a covalent bonding model that's called the LE model, the localized electron model. And these bonds are going to be formed by overlap of atomic orbitals. So all those 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, those orbitals are now overlapping between, in, in the last case, between a chlorine atom and a hydrogen atom. And that overlap is what causes the bond, an attraction from an electron in one to a nucleus in another, and vice versa nucleus in one to an electron in the other. And that attractive force is what forms a covalent bond. So this localized electron model, the name implies the electrons are staying with their atoms. They're local. 
They're not delocalized like metallic bonds where electrons are free to move. These are localized electrons. And we're gonna describe them by looking at their Lewis structure. Okay, so we're gonna to have to draw Lewis structures, their Vesper shapes, and what's their hybridization and bond angle comes along with that. So we could, we could just as easily add that in here. So we're going to go through each one of these. This first video should get us through Lewis structures pretty comfortably. And I think you guys, summer kids, you guys did a really thorough job with Lewis structures. And, and we did it in, in the classes before, as for those of you with the prereq. But we're, we're going we're gonna to visit it again, just so everyone's on the same even footing and we know what we need to know for the college board. That's the name of the game. So to do a covalent Lewis structure, now I know it's covalent because of the difference in electronegativities, okay? We're gonna write the element that can make the most bonds in the center. That's how we know what element goes in the center. And so how do we know how many bonds things can make? Remember, if we get up here, it goes one bond, two bonds, skip over it, go to group 13, three bonds, four bonds, three bonds, two bonds, one bond, no bonds. We're not gonna worry, there are exceptions. We're not gonna worry about xenon tetrafluoride making a compound. That's not our concern right now, okay? So the element that makes the most bonds will be written in the middle. When we look at a chemical formula, often the central atom will be written first. So look for that as kind of a clue. That's not an always, but that's a sometimes, okay? Then we're gonna write valence electrons for all the atoms. Now you guys, I I've done this so long and this is the step that students don't wanna do. They just wanna start writing out atoms and start drawing bonds and connecting things. Please write the dots and connect the dots. You don't have enough background knowledge yet to just start drawing lines and connecting things, okay? And then the next thing you do, then you connect the dots. And we gotta make octets with preference given to the element with the higher electronegativity. Well, we don't get the values, doesn't matter. Elements in the upper right-hand corner are the ones that are gonna get the preference for their higher electronegativities, okay? Note, this one's an important one. Groups one, two, and 13 will not form octets. They can't. They just don't have enough valence electrons to do that. But look at rule three. The preference goes to the element with the higher electronegativity. So magnesium's not getting an octet. Not at all. Iodine is getting an octet. How come? Because iodine has the higher electronegativity, the higher attraction, the pull for those electrons. So what happens is we draw out our magnesium iodide. Magnesium has two dots. Iodine has seven. You're welcome to use a dash, all right? But be careful. My caution is a dash is not a dot. So make your dashes long enough that they can't be misconstrued as dots. It's very common on the board exam, and you will have to on, on my chapter test, you're going to have to draw Lewis structures, and I don't want to have a discussion. There will not be a discussion about whether that's a line or whether it's a dot. So use your lines but use them cautiously, all right? Make them big enough that they're aligned. Don't give me the half a line dot thing, okay? So connect things together. Look at the magnesium. Okay, it's got four electrons. Okay, but iodine has an octet now. Now let's look at the dipoles because we have 2.5 minus 1.2. This is a 1.3 eneg difference. This is also a difference on the periodic table from magnesium all the way over to iodine. 
that's a huge separation on the periodic table. And when you have that kind of separation on the periodic table, you're going to have very polar things. All right. Probably not going to be ionic because iodine is so far down on the table. If we were further up on the table, we might be worried about this turning ionic on us. Okay. But this is just polar. And so which way to the dipoles? They always go toward the higher electronegative element. So the iodine goes out. The iodine's got an octet. You've got a beautiful linear structure there. Pretty simple. Magnesium didn't get an octet. Iodine did. Here's another one with a group 13. Here's aluminum, right? Aluminum bromide. So aluminum can form three bonds. Bromine really only forms one bond. So let's put the aluminum in the middle, give it three dots. Put the bromines out to the side. Pair, 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 dot. Pair, 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 dot. Pair, 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 dot. Now connect the dots with the aluminum. Aluminum's only going to get six electrons. That's okay. It only has an electronegativity of 1.5. But bromine, 2.8, it's pretty electronegative. It's pulling on those aluminum electrons. It's pulling those aluminum electrons away from the central atom. So you have polar bonds. Beautiful Lewis structure. You guys saw this this summer. This is the bonding Magna Carta. It's in the module as well. You aren't going to see this anywhere else. This is something I've put together to show the valence electrons, what charge it's going to prefer if it goes ionic. There's the preferred charge. How many bonds it tends to make? One, two, three, four. Three, two, one, crescendos. Lone pairs, which don't come into play until group 15, 16, 17, and 18. And then our Vesper shapes. There will be another video on Vesper shapes coming up, but those are nice. Now, keep in mind, just because something is in group 14 does not mean that it's going to bond tetrahedrally. But if you have a molecule that bonds with four bonds and no lone pairs, that is going to be a tetrahedron. The localized electron model dictates to us that if you have this many bonds and this many lone pairs, then this will be the predicted Vesper shape. And it works pretty good. Hybridization is another one that will come into play. There will be another video on that. It doesn't go with the column, but it goes with the bonds and the lone pairs. So the bonds and lone pairs are true to the shape, the hybridization, and the bond angle. The column is more of a guideline and a predictor. So it's not a foolproof method. But there are a lot of things that can happen in group 17. But traditionally, if it forms one bond and three lone pairs, it's going to be linear. It's going to hybridize sp3 probably and be a 180 degree bond angle on that. OK, the two exceptions that we're going to start with are trigonal bipyramidal when we make five bonds and no lone pairs, and the octahedral six bonds and no lone pairs. Later on, there will be a lesson on exceptions too. And there are more exceptions. There are a lot more shapes than are just on this Magna Carta sheet, but it's a good guideline for a start. The College Board has narrowed down a lot of the exceptions that they've asked you to learn these are the biggies, but they do want you to be able to identify and predict shape, hybridization, and bond angle. These all go along. And they all go along with drawing those 
covalent Lewis structures. So a little bit more practice in there. Here's CH4. We look at carbon and carbon forms four bonds. Carbon's almost always in the center, okay? So put your carbon there and make your dots. You almost wanna draw this like the shape it's going to be. And I'm trying to draw it like a tetrahedral because that's what carbon does when it makes four bonds and no lone pairs. In this case, we have four hydrogens to attach to it. So let's look at the electronegativity first, figure out the bond type. 2.5 and 2.1 gives me an eneg difference of 0.4. If we hit one of those lines, 0.4, we're gonna round that up. We're gonna push 0.4 to be a polar bond. It's more polar than nonpolar, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can draw a covalent structure here. We know we're not ionic. So put your carbon in the middle and then put your four hydrogens to pair up with it. Bond, 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 bond. And in this case, the dipoles are pointing in towards the carbon. Now, those dipoles are going to become important when we talk about molecule polarity. And there's a video for that coming up as well. Okay. So, carbon makes a nice tetrahedral shape, four bonds, no loners. Okay. Everybody's equivalent polar bond. Life's good. Let's look at ammonia, NH3. It's a real common molecule used by the college board. So check your electronegativities, 3.0, 2.1. I got a 0.9 polar bond. No worries. Okay. Put the nitrogen in the middle. How come nitrogen can make three bonds? Hydrogen can make one. Hydrogen's never going in the middle unless it's a binary molecule, in which case there is no middle in a binary molecule. There's a right side and a left side. So put the nitrogen in the middle, five dots, one, two, three, four, five, three hydrogens, put them on the solos, connect the dots. When we're done, if we notice nitrogen now has two, four, six, eight valence electrons. That's a good model. The central atom forms more bonds and the more electronegative element gets an octet. That's a good Lewis structure. That's what that tells me. The more electronegative gets an octet, we're drawing very good Lewis structures here. So now let's look at a couple others. Water, we all have seen water. Just walk through it real quick. Oxygen's three, five, two, one. The difference is one, four. This is polar. Put the oxygen in the middle. How come? Oxygen makes two bonds, hydrogen makes one, oxygen goes in the middle, it gets six electrons. Now connect the hydrogens. The hydrogens get a duet, that's a good thing for hydrogen. The oxygen gets an octet, that's a very good thing for oxygen. Okay, we do draw it angular like that, that bent shape because what I've got, <coughs> excuse me, is I have two bonds and two lone pair. That's the description for a bent molecule with a bond angle of 104 degrees. Okay, let's look at a diatomic now. I2, iodine. 2525, five, it's a nonpolar bond. Okay. There's no central atom. Everything is very symmetrical. Everything's very clean. You must write all the lone pairs. They have to be present. If the board asks for them, you don't have them. We can't award points for that. Okay. Hydrogen chloride's another diet. Uh, 
binary. 2.1, 3.0, I got 0.9. This puppy is polar, and it's going to be polar towards the chlorine. Chlorine has 2, 4, 6, 7. Shares one with hydrogen. Looky there, 8. The more electronegative element gets an octet. How do we know when to double bond? Okay, carbon loves to double bond. There's a, a almost a commandment of chemistry that carbon will always get an octet, which means it can double bond. It has the ability. So when I draw this out, if I've got my carbon, carbon goes in the center, it goes one, two, three, four. Put an oxygen on each side, one, two, three, four, five, six. Do the same thing over on the other side. The first attachment's very easy to see. The second attachment, this banana bond, actually happens. Now, are we really making a banana bond? No, not at all. This electron's going to move. It's going to come over here. This electron's going to move. It's going to come over here. And when we clean it up, we're going to have a double bond. And when we look at the Vesper shape, we're going to look at the central atom. We're going to go carbon. And that carbon is going to have two bonds and no lone pairs. That molecule of carbon dioxide, that's linear. Now I've jumped ahead a little bit with some of the Vesper shapes because I think you guys are ready for some of that. But the key here is the bond type with the electronegativity and the Lewis structure. That's key to drawing these clean structures that help us predict the shapes, the bond angles, and the hybridization, which is all yet to come. So that's my discussion on covalent Lewis structures. I'm Smath. I certainly hope this video helps you. Thanks for watching.